So in this question, we have to decide where we should place point P on segment AB so that this angle theta is going to be maximized. And this is an optimization question, so the first thing we need to do is to draw a picture. Obviously, this question has supplied us with a picture already, but what we want to do is add a few additional details to the picture to make our process more understandable. So for example, the segment AP, we can label that X, and then hopefully we can see that since the entire segment AB is equal to three, and then this portion here we've just identified as X, that means this little leftover portion right there, BP in other words, is going to have a length of three minus X. So we're gonna squeeze that label in right there for the segment BP. In addition, we want to identify a couple of additional angles here. So this angle right here we're going to call alpha, and then this angle here we can call beta. And after adding those details to our picture, the next thing we need to do is to develop a few equations to help us figure out what the maximum angle is going to be. We can perhaps start with the simplest equation. If we look carefully, alpha, theta, and beta all form a straight line segment right there. Basically, they form the segment A, P, B. And we all know from geometry that a straight line segment adds up to 180 degrees. So we can say here that the angle alpha plus the angle theta plus the angle beta will equal 180 degrees. Now, since we're trying to maximize theta, it's going to be useful to us to solve this for theta. So we can do that by subtracting alpha from both sides, and we can also subtract beta from both sides. The alphas cancel out on the left, as do the betas, and now we have theta is equal to 180 minus alpha minus beta. So this is a nice equation, but the problem with this equation is that it is in terms of alpha and beta. It's going to be better for us to express it in terms of x. So that's kind of our next challenge, is to try to express this equation in terms of x. And to do that, we're going to use some trigonometry. Let's take a look at the larger of the two triangles, and in particular, let's take a look at alpha. And we can see from that larger triangle, if we apply the tangent function, that the tangent of alpha, which we all know is opposite over adjacent, that would equal the opposite side of five over the adjacent side, the side adjacent to the angle alpha, which is x. So this is a nice equation we can derive from the large triangle. What we'll do is solve this equation for alpha. And to solve for alpha, we can take the inverse tangent on both sides of this equation. The inverse tangent and the tangent essentially cancel out on the left side, so now we can see that alpha is equal to the inverse tangent of 5 over x. And that's a wonderful result because that means we have alpha in terms of x. So in a moment, we're going to make a little substitution. We're going to replace this alpha with that expression right there. But we would like to do something similar for beta, wouldn't we? So beta we can come up with an expression for by looking at the smaller triangle and once again applying the tangent function. So look at the smaller triangle and you can see that the tangent of beta again is equal to the opposite side which is 2 divided by the adjacent side which in this case is 3 minus x. You would then do the inverse tangent on both sides and you could see that beta is equal to the inverse tangent of 2 over 3 minus x. So we're going to make a couple of substitutions as noted. Beta will be substituted with this expression and then alpha will be substituted with that expression into our little theta equation. So let's come down here and let's say that theta is equal to 180 degrees minus alpha, which we will substitute with inverse tangent of five over x minus beta, which we will substitute with inverse tangent of two over three minus x. Very good, this is wonderful. We've got an equation th for theta in terms of a single variable x. So now that we have this equation, our next step is to differentiate it. Remember, when you're trying to find either a maximum or a minimum in other problems, what you really need to do after getting the right equation is to differentiate it. For a maximum, you're trying to figure out 
where on your equation you have a tangent line slope equal to zero. So basically, the derivative at that particular point is going to equal zero, and that's why we're going to go ahead and differentiate. We're going to find the derivative. So we can say that theta prime equals the following. Now, the derivative of a constant like 180 degrees or pi radians is just zero. So that's easy. That's zero. Minus, uh-oh, we've got to do the inverse tangent, excuse me, the derivative of the inverse tangent of a 5 over x function. Now, we may recall that the derivative of the inverse tangent of, let's call it u, with respect to u, is basically equal to the derivative of u over 1 plus u squared. Probably learned about this in an earlier section. Now, we're going to apply that. It might also be useful to remember that 5 over x can be rewritten as 5x to the negative 1. So that's going to help us do our derivative. This 5x to the negative 1 is essentially the u of this derivative equation. And we can see from the derivative equation that to compute the derivative, we need to first do the derivative of our u, which would mean the derivative of 5x to the negative 1. So that would be negative 5x to the negative 2. And then we put this over 1 plus our u squared, and our u was 5x to the negative 1. I think in this case, instead of saying 5x to the negative 1, we'll keep it written as just 5 over x. It's just going to make it a little nicer to square it. Don't forget to square it. So that would be the derivative of the inverse tangent of 5 over x. We have to do a similar process for the derivative of the inverse tangent of 2 over 3 minus x. This one's actually even worse because we would probably want to rewrite that. And when I say that, I mean this 2 over 3 minus x. might be helpful to rewrite that as 2 times 3 minus x to the negative 1, like that. And so when we do the derivative, we're going to have to do the derivative of our u. That is the derivative of this expression right there. That would require a chain rule. So things get a little dicey here. But basically, you're going to pull that negative 1 down. So that's going to make negative 2. Then you're going to multiply by 3 minus x. Then you're going to raise it to the power of negative 2, because you had to subtract 1 from that power. But then the chain rule says to multiply by the derivative of 3 minus x, which is the sort of inner function. And the derivative of that is just negative 1. So that's the u prime. And then underneath that, we're going to do 1 plus our u, which is 2 over 3 minus x, and then square it. So that's our derivative. It's a bit of a mess. And you probably recall that to find a maximum, not only do you do the derivative, as we noted, you have to set it equal to 0. So the great challenge right now is to solve for x in this case. Probably need to clean this up a little bit. So let's take a careful look at some things here. We have a minus and a minus right there. So that's just going to make that positive. So basically, we're going to have positive 5 over x squared. And then that's going to be over 1 plus, let's square the 5 over x. So we square the 5 and we square the x like that. Over here, the signs get a little dicey because you have a minus and a minus, And then we have another minus 1 there. So all combined, that would be a minus overall. So it's going to be minus 2 over 3 minus x squared. So we just converted that 3 minus x to the negative 2. We shifted it to the denominator, made it 3 minus x to the positive 2. And then that is still on top of 1 plus, we can square the 2. That's going to make 4. We can square the 3 minus x. Perhaps for now, we'll just leave that as 3 minus x squared. And this is still equal to 0. This is a joyous experience here, trying to solve this for x. Let's see what we can do here. Why don't we multiply each term of the numerator and denominator by x squared? We can try that, see where that leads us. Now, by doing that, these x squareds would cancel out. That gives us 5 over, and then x squared times 1, which is just x squared. These x squareds would cancel, so you get 
x squared plus 25. That's pretty nice, actually. That was a sweet little move. Maybe we'll try the same thing over here. Why don't we multiply everything by 3 minus x squared? This may just work because then these cancel and those cancel. And this gives us a minus 2 over, well, let's see, 3 minus x squared times 1 is still 3 minus x squared. And then we have just plus 4. So this looks a little nicer already. And let's see, again, there's probably multiple ways we could proceed here, but we're going to try the path of least resistance. So I think it might be beneficial for us to add this crazy 2 over 3 minus x squared plus 4. Add it to both sides. So for now, I'll just put quote marks there to save a little time. These will cross off. This gives us 5 over x squared plus 25. And then that equals that term on the other side. So 2 over 3 minus x squared plus 4. I like this maneuver here because now we can cross multiply. We can multiply that way and then we can multiply that way. Multiplying the by the yellow path, we're gonna have 2x squared plus 50. And then multiplying by the green path, let's see, we're gonna, it's gonna get a little hairy here again. We're gonna do five times the quantity, three minus x squared plus four. Okay, so still some work cut out for ourselves here. Let's square the three minus x, so that's written, remember, as 3 minus x times 3 minus x. When you multiply that out using the FOIL method, you'll get 9 minus 3x minus another 3x, so minus 6x, and then plus x squared. That's pretty cool. And let's see here. We've got to be careful in terms of how we're writing this because then we still have this plus 4 here. All right. We're getting somewhere. And then next we can distribute this 5. Now be careful again, you have to distribute the 5 to those three terms, but also to the 4. So now you're going to have 45 minus 30x plus 5x squared plus 20. And then what we need to do, because we have ourselves a quadratic equation, is get everything equal to 0. So we need to subtract the 2x squared from both sides. We need to subtract the 50 from both sides. So the left side becomes zero. Let's see, we're gonna end up with three x squared minus 30 x. Now you have 45 minus 50, but then you have plus 20. So you're gonna end up with a plus 15 like that. We can simplify this by dividing each term by three. Makes it a little bit nicer, but then to solve this, we unfortunately have to use the quadratic equation. So we'll rewrite that for reference. And then we're going to begin to plug into the quadratic formula. So here we go. We're going to have negative b. So our b is negative 10. So a negative negative 10 is a positive 10 plus or minus the big square root of negative 10 squared minus 4 times 1 times 5 all over 2 times 1, which is just 2. And now we need to do 100 minus 20, which of course is 80. So we're going to have 10 plus or minus root 80 over 2. Root 80 can be rewritten as root 16 times root 5. The square root of 16 is 4, so now we have 10 plus or minus 4 radical 5 over 2. And then we can divide the 10 by 2 and the 4 by 2, so we end up with 5 plus or minus 2 radical 5. Okay, so these are the two solutions for x. We can probably reject one of them because, for example, 5 minus 2 radical 5, well, no, that one we actually might want to keep, but 5 plus 2 radical 5, I'm just punching it into my calculator, that ends up as 9.47. So if you punch these into your calculators, you're going to get about 0.528 for one of your answers, and then the other one is 9.47. But can x really be 9.47? Let's go back up to the picture. And let's recall that this entire segment right here had a length of only 3. So it's impossible for x to be anything larger than 3. And therefore, we can reject this value for x. So the answer that we so far obtain is that x is going to equal 5 minus 2 radical 5, 
we have to prove that that indeed minimizes or maximizes, depending on the question, the theta. Now, we recall that this question asks us to maximize the angle theta. And so we have to prove that this indeed is a maximum. And maybe one way of doing that is just applying the first derivative test. You may have seen your calculus teachers make a number line. They probably plotted the critical number on a number line. And then what they did is they plugged in a sample value into the derivative. Now, the derivative here, we have to go back and capture that. It was a rather messy expression, we recall. And after we had sort of simplified it, we had obtained this expression right here. So let's copy paste this below. This is our derivative. Let's remove that little slash there. And what we wanna do is pick a number less than five minus two radical five. Remember five minus two radical five was this decimal. So we might wanna try one half. So we would actually have to plug one half into this derivative. I challenge you to do that. It's a little bit annoying, frankly, but basically if we plugged the one half into our derivative, what we would find is that it comes out to be a number greater than zero. So this means that the theta function is increasing for a value or values less than our critical number. And then what we would do is plug in a critical number or past or larger than five minus two root five. So we might just choose one and theta prime of one is going to be a number that's less than zero. That means the derivative, excuse me, that means the function is decreasing on that interval. So it increases and then decreases. At the critical point, we can see there would indeed be a maximum. So that sort of proves via the first derivative test that theta is maximized when x is equal to five minus two radical five. And that's pretty much the answer. We can go back and recall that x represented the length of segment AP. So if you have to report your answer in terms of the length of AP, well, that would be the length of AP. Five minus two radical five. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I'd appreciate it. My Venmo ID is below, but if not, no problem. I still appreciate you taking the time to watch.